Well, good morning. Uh, we'll just give people a few moments to come through and then we'll get started. We've got uh, some more people just logging in now. It's right on 11 o'clock. For those of you who have just come into the room, we'll just give people a couple more minutes as they're starting to, to log in. We're right on 11 o'clock, so we'll be uh, we'll be underway shortly. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Nick Gordon. Uh, we're just going to give people a few more minutes to, to log in. Um, it's just on 11 o'clock, so there's a, uh, I can see there are still some more people who are just entering uh, into the webinar. Uh, in the meantime, uh, just to uh, remind you that if you go to the, uh, the Junira website, uh, you'll see kind of there a huge range of things coming up over the next few weeks. Uh, a lot of very exciting, a lot of very different things. So it would be, it would be, yeah, if you're looking uh, to keep in touch, um, if, uh, definitely head to the website to have a look. Uh, so we just have a, a few more people, I think, on their on their way in, but we'll we'll get uh, started uh, properly in a moment, looking at the the art and life of Jeffrey Smart, the art and influences of Jeffrey Smart. Okay, uh, well, I'll, I shall make a make a start, uh, a gentle start, and then we'll get into the, the full flow as we start looking in detail at some of the, the art and the influences of Geoffrey Smart, one of Australia's most loved painters. Uh, just to let you know how well, we'll do this, if you want to leave, uh, if you have questions or you have comments, uh, please leave them in the, the chat or the, the q and I'll keep an eye on those throughout the uh, lecture this morning, but I'll leave time at the end to be able to address your uh, address the questions that you send through uh, in the chat or the Q&A. So my name is Dr. Nick Gordon, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here uh, talking uh, for Junira again. Uh, and yes, uh, this topic is one that uh, I've spent uh, quite a reasonable amount of time uh, looking at and continually revising uh, over the past decade or so, uh, and I would also like to acknowledge the the immense help that I've had while developing my work on Smart uh, from Stephen Rogers, who used to be uh, Jeffrey Smart's archivist uh, and has an immense knowledge of Smart. So I'd like to just acknowledge my uh, uh, my debt to him and kind of the help that he has given me uh, many years ago uh, while beginning to kind of investigate Smart in more detail. Anyway, I shall share my screen and we'll get started looking into the life and work of Jeffrey Smart. Um, so also, if you have any questions or comments that come to you after the session today, please feel free to get in touch with me at nick at the short down below. Uh, I will get back to you. Sometimes there's a, a little bit of a delay, but I will get back to you uh, if you have any, any comments or questions uh, that come up uh, during or after the session today. Anyway, I think we're, what we'll do today is we'll start off by looking uh, at one Jeffrey Smart work in detail to try and piece together some of what he meant when he made statements about his own work, some of them which are quite self-deprecating. So when he says, for example, that uh, it's just the right shape and the right colour and the right place, it's just geometry really, those sort of comments I think are very self-deprecating, but it's also worth looking at what that actually might mean. So we'll look at one work in detail and then we'll, uh, from kind of, hmm, I suppose, a, a period in his life where all of these ideas start coming together, 
and then we'll take a step back to look through uh, the early influences where he's getting these different ideas, different approaches that he's taking to his art. And then we'll step forward from this work that we start with to look with where he goes with these ideas. Once these ideas really come together and he starts becoming uh, the Jeffrey Smart who is instantly recognisable when you see his work in a book or in a gallery, you can see it across the room and you know, you know straight away that that is his work, uh, that very distinctive style that he develops. So the work we're going to start with is Morning Practice at Bayer from 1969 and 1970. Uh, Smart had said about this work that this work is a hymn of praise to raw umber, uh, the, the colour, the pigment, um, which goes cool against red and warm against blue. The shadow of the cube and the sky must be raw umber and white, all joining up as Piero often does with, within the play of parallels. And you can see just how closely kind of uh, the, raw, uh, the raw umber mixed with white is in the shadow cast by the cube and the legs of the man uh, with that sky that kind of it's so close together that that edge of the wall where the shadow and the sky meet almost, uh, almost dissolves. Uh, we're left to uh, infer the, almost infer the existence that there is a line separating the shadow from the sky behind it. Uh, what he means by this as well is that our raw umber is a, is a very good workhorse colour. Uh, it helps to bring out different shades amongst uh, with other pigments, uh, and is very useful for being able to go uh, to go cooler or to go or warmer depending on how you mix it together. But it's also a, a colour that we find him using quite extensively, especially in his skies, and that's one of the things that I think is often a giveaway for a work being a smart is these uh, slightly heavy umberish skies. So sometimes in reproduction, uh, those skies are made bluer. There's an assumption that the sky should be bluer than uh, Smart actually painted it. But when you see them in the flesh, often there is kind of an um, uh, undertone to those skies, which helps, I think, also create a, a kind of broodingness, but also this wonderful play of light between the sharpness of the sunlight as it hits the wall uh, and that slight dullness of the sky behind it helps accentuate that. The other part of this statement is when he's looking at uh, the composition as all joining up uh, within the play of par parallels as Piero often does. So it's a very self-conscious uh, comment on the influence of Piero della Francesca on Geoffrey Smart's work. When we start looking at a bit more closely what he means by this play of parallels, we first of all start noticing that the parallel lines uh, joining the cube, we would expect a cube seen on an angle will produce multiple parallel lines. Uh, but the way that he then links those parallel lines up here uh, with the angle of the shadow and the angle of the shadow over here as well. So he kind of, even the shadows are placed perfectly to create a kind of a play between parallel lines. Uh, but the parallel lines, especially when we start looking at the very obvious vertical and horizontal parallel lines, start creating uh, a network. Uh, and in this network of parallel lines, I think we start seeing that there are repetitions of shape and repetitions of proportional relationships that we'll look a little bit more uh, closely at. This is something that in, in part Smart is getting from Piero della Francesca, but something I think he's getting more directly from Piero della Francesca is the use of these vertical and horizontal parallel lines to create a kind of a rhythmic structure across, across and up, up through the work. Uh, and that, that kind of that net that this creates, that kind of rhythmic structure across, across the composition, then helps balance this very careful use of linear perspective here, which is marked it in red, that the linear perspective that give, gives a sense of recession in the space here is created almost entirely just with where he has placed uh, the lines that create uh, the, the red of that uh, fence uh, that recedes into the background. Uh, the dotted line here as well is showing where, the, where those red lines converge, their points of convergence, uh, is a vanishing point, a point which gives the, the total structure to uh, a linear perspective construction. Uh, and that line there is following the horizon, kind of where our eye level is. And because our eye level is at, uh, along this line of the dotted, uh, along the dotted red line, it means that we look down at a slight angle onto the man's chest, but we look up towards his knees. So it's a very, very careful use of foreshortening based on this linear perspective. So it is a structure that he has borrowed uh, from Piero della Francesca. Uh, incidentally, Piero della Francesca's work was um, 
uh, I suppose, rediscovered uh, in Smart's lifetime, that it was repopularized, there was more work being put into uh, restoring, recovering, finding where Piero della Francesca's work was uh, throughout the 1920s and 30s in Italy. Uh, and Piero della Francesca, like Caravaggio, starts getting much more uh, attention from the, the non-Italian speaking world uh, in the later 40s and the 1950s. So for Smart, uh, this is kind of the artist who is suddenly getting a lot of attention, but there's also this uh, understanding of geometry that comes through in Piero della Francesca's work that is far more sophisticated than the geometry of most other Italian Renaissance painters. And Smart seems to pick up on this uh, and is deeply attracted to it, how he creates this sense of order, this calmness, that seems the quietness that seems to fill these works. Uh, in this case here, it's just going to show you kind of the, the use of uh, Piero's use of horizontal and vertical parallel lines across uh, creating kind of a, I suppose, a structure across the foreground and the way that that linear perspective marked in red shoots down from behind that. This is by way of conceiving of a painting that is created in the Italian Renaissance of thinking of the painting, the square of the painting, the frame of the painting as a window that looks in. So we imagine that these are markers that are put down across that window and it's the red lines, that perspective that creates uh, the illusion of space behind that window. We see this used in not only Piero della Francesca's work, but by Piero della Francesca's followers. In this case here, the ideal city, uh, when Smart first had kind of been traveling around Italy, this work had been attributed to Piero della Francesca. And it's only more recently been reattributed to probably Francesco Laurana instead. But we have again the same method of using these play of parallels across the surface uh, and those red orthogonal lines creating the perspective that guides us behind, guides us deep into that pictorial space. But I think Smart goes a bit further and he's uh, under, underselling himself perhaps when he says this is just kind of a, uh, something that Piero does uh, and me playing around with uh, raw umber and what you can do with it. And I think when we start looking more closely we start finding that these lines, these parallel lines are not placed accidentally. They're not placed symmetrically. There is use of balance, the way that kind of the brick here moves forward to balance off this space moving backwards on the other side. But there's a lot more to Smart's geometry going, uh, going on here. And I'll just, uh, show you a little bit more of what's going on. So for example, uh, as is often the case with Smart's work, we find that the, uh, the size of the canvas is not accidental, that the dimensions of the canvas are uh, not because he's walked into a shop and it's a standard canvas size. The canvas size is actually measured so that the proportion of the canvas has some sort of geometric proportional relationship to every element contained within that canvas. So it's very, very clearly and very carefully thought out. In this case here, the relationship between the square marked in red to what uh, the rectangle marked in yellow is an approximation, a very close approximation of the, the golden ratio. You can't have an absolute um, number put on the golden ratio because it's, a, it's an irrational number uh, like pi, kind of if you decimalize it, it just keeps going and going and going. Um, but it is a very, very close use of the, of the golden ratio that gives Smart this, uh, this, these canvas dimensions. And you notice too, that the borderline between where kind of the red and the red of the square and where the extension of it in yellow is kind of all keyed to this tip here of that corner of the cube that is very carefully balanced in this play of par parallels uh, on the man's feet. When we start looking further into that, you can see that these, uh, the positioning here were marked by the blue line uh, and on the other side as well. Uh, create at the same distance between, uh, between the edge of the canvas and that point as between the edge of the canvas and the line marked here by that, the vertical parallel of that brick. Uh, that, that helps kind of frame the vision. It, help, it stops our eyes falling out of the side of the painting. It helps guide us in towards the center. But when we mark those out, we find that there is a repetition of this proportional relationship between so kind of the red square is to the black square what the yellow rectangle is to the black rectangle. Uh, the proportional relationship is repeated and we find that it's repeated over here again uh, by using the same system but just uh, duplicating it, kind of doubling it rather than uh, kind of increasing it rather than reducing it. Uh, so we have this kind of play that uh, of geometry 
that's holding that box in place. That box gives us the visual cue that we need to start working backwards and deconstructing the geometry inside Smart's work. So in this sense, his work is very, very playful. So he's making art historical references, but also geometric uh, and proportional relationships. Uh, they give this kind of a structure that means that the more you start kind of analyzing these work, trying to figure out how they work, uh, the more interesting they become, the more repetitions of uh, different geometric uh, games being played in the work you start to discover. But this work that we kind of, so while we expect Smart's work to have this sort of rigorous geometry behind it, it's not something that is immediately present in his early work. So I'm going to take a step back to look through some of Smart's early work and some of those early influences that lead up to him starting to create works uh, like this, which when you see on the wall, you know is a Jeffrey Smart. Whereas some of these earlier works, uh, you, might, you could think that they were the work of an entirely different artist. So these are some of Smart's early works while he was still living in Adelaide. Smart had grown up in Adelaide. He'd had to, uh, during the depression, his family had had to move from suburban Adelaide into the inner city. And we get a sense that, uh, that comes through, especially in Smart's autobiography, uh, that that early experience of being in the city, living in a flat in the city, uh, where there are laneways, there are kind of slightly slummy areas of the city. There's an actual interest in those parts of the city rather than kind of the grand views. And I think that's a theme that, see, that continues to run throughout Smart's uh, entire oeuvre, this sense that he's focused on the less, what we would normally think of as kind of the, the parts of a city you don't paint, the parts of a city you don't celebrate. Uh, and he's interested in those from an early age. Uh, Smart is educated as an artist in uh, Adelaide. He starts working as an art teacher in Adelaide. Uh, but in the early 40s, uh, he comes across uh, Dorrit Black. And Dorrit Black is a key early influence on Smart. So Dorrit Black had studied in Paris in the 1920s and was influenced uh, by Cubism um, and also the geometric art of André Lerte. Uh, so she is kind of a number of Australian, primarily Australian female artists in the 1920s who are deeply, deeply engaged with what was then the most cutting edge, most contemporary art going coming around in the European world. And they're bringing it back to Australia. In the case of Dora Black, she then kind of uh, uses kind of this new knowledge, this new way of painting, this new way of thinking and seeing the world uh, to start bringing those ideas back to Australia and to start helping promote the careers of a whole range of uh, emerging artists, as well as her role as a teacher. So she introduces Smart to Cubism, uh, the idea that uh, the composition uh, is founded on ge uh, geometric construction uh, and that a composition should be dynamic rather than static. And that it's about the control and the placement of lines that allow you to create a degree of dynamism, something that makes your eye move around a canvas rather than stare uh, blankly at one point that's been fixed for you. In uh, 1931, before she goes back to Adelaide, uh, Dorrit Black had set up the Modern Art Centre in Sydney, and she's promoting the works of a number of these emerging Australian modernists, people like Cossington Smith, uh, Crawley, Fazell, and others, uh, kind of working through uh, the Modern Art Centre that she sets up in Sydney. However, Smart's work in the, the mid 40s is also showing other influences. Um, so first of all, I'll mention here that kind of we have this love, we see in this work, this uh, love that Smart will have uh, throughout his life of the receding curve. So showing a curve receding into space is a surprisingly difficult thing to do. To show straight lines converging, receding into, into the painting is reasonably easy. Uh, but more complex structures like curves, in this case, it's a reasonably regular curve of the railway track. Uh, that itself, to show that receding into the background is difficult. As we'll see a little bit later, some of the curves, the very complex shapes that Smart seems to enjoy playing with and the way they recede is something we see emerging in his work in the 1940s uh, and something that will continue into his work into the 2000s. But the other key influence I think here is perhaps a direct or indirect influence of Drysdale on, on kind of our Smart's work. So I think part of this influence is mostly that Drysdale was leading a kind of a new direction in Australian landscape painting, one that I think is best to think of as being a, a post-pastoral depiction of the Australian landscape. So we think that of artists such as Streeton, kind of the, the, the end of the Heidelberg School, uh, is still very, very dominant in Australian landscape painting right throughout the 20s and into the early 30s. 
and it's a way of celebrating the role of work. So we have a lot of heroic figures, for the most part, men uh, riding horses, swinging axes, using an ads uh, with women for the most part in the background serving tea. It's an idea of a kind of an Australian landscape that had been, I suppose, it reflected the uh, the colonisation of Australia, uh, the creation of new pastoral lands in the late 19th century, and that remains a very dominant way of seeing the landscape into the 1920s. Whereas with somebody like Drysdale, we're moving away from that kind of that pastoralist depiction of the landscape. In Drysdale's case, it's less about celebrating uh, the heroic efforts of the men who made the land, uh, and more about showing the the ordinary. And I think that's a, that becomes a key influence on Smart. This kind of a interest in showing kind of the ordinary parts of a city. Um, there's also, we think, I think a more direct influence uh, in that kind of Drysdale was at Hill End after World War II, along with Donald Friend and others, including Jeffrey Smart. Um, and I think there's this common interest that runs between the two, this interest in showing the ordinary rather than the heroic. There's also, I think, a visual similarity in some of their works, especially uh, Smart's work in the mid 1940s, where he too is going out to places that aren't normally painted. So in Drysdale's case, he's going out to these uh, these towns that are dying, uh, dying in the depression, uh, dying through World War II, that shrinking down of uh, rural populations, rural towns as they start to become ghost towns. Um, Smart too is doing this, he's going up to the Adelaide Hills, for example, um, and painting uh, some of what he's seeing there, this kind of a, this decay of this uh, rural ideal that had been created in Australia. In other cases, he's celebrating other industries, and uh, in this case, it's uh, with the Kapunda Mines. Um, but I think what's interesting here is when you look at his uh, construction of buildings and compare those to um, Drysdale's construction of buildings, there's quite a, a similarity. Uh, there's also a tonal similarity in how they're approaching showing off uh, this landscape with that kind of quite harsh raking light coming across. Uh, and the figures here aren't really being celebrated for doing anything fantastic. They're doing something ordinary. So in Drysdale, they're playing cricket in the street. In here in Smart, the figures aren't there doing their work. The figures here are relaxing, jumping into the water, doing very ordinary things. So we have these early influences on smart people like uh, Black and um, this kind of uh, and Drysdale, an idea of a different sort of landscape that could be painted. Should note that that's only one direction that Australian landscape painting is taking in the 1940s. Another key direction is being taken by people like Boyd and Nolan, who are seeking to, uh, I suppose, create a grand new mythology of the landscape. Uh, but smart's not really going down that direction at all. The key change though I think we start seeing in Smart's work happens in the late 1940s and early 1950s where we start seeing some new ideas, new experiences entering his work, uh, even if it takes 10 years or so before they start to really come together inside, uh, inside his work. So if, if from 1948 to 1951 Smart is mostly in the UK and Europe. Uh, if you want a, a good rollicking read, Smart is a great raconteur uh, and his autobiography and how his account of how he got to Europe is uh, hilarious. Um, he went rather than kind of getting a regular boat, he um, took himself over on a cheap ticket where he'd be working on freighters thinking kind of, oh, this will just be plenty of time, I'll just sit in my cabin and paint. And then you find that he spends most of his time on his way to Europe cleaning floors and whatnot. Um, you anyway, know, it's kind of, it's a, it's a wonderful, he, he's a great storyteller. Um, this time in Europe, though, I think leads to a number of distinct changes in Smart's work. And this is his contact with contemporary European and American painting, uh, which he sees in New York on a, on a stop on the boat on the way over. Uh, but it's also his, he's gaining firsthand knowledge of the traditions of European painting, uh, both of Renaissance masters, but also of modern masters like Cezanne. Um, in the work here, the net menders from 1950, though, I think we're seeing the influence of Giorgio de Chirico's work. De Chirico came to have a, a very profound influence over a whole generation of or multiple generations of Australian artists. Uh, but Smart does something, I think, a little bit uh, different to what, say, an artist like Gleason, who is also influenced by de Chirico, does. So just to go with de Chirico's most famous series of work is Piazza d'Italia. Uh, these scenes which are kind of very, very, very uh, paired back, these uh, depopulated urban landscapes, uh, these intellectual elements that are being joined together that help compress time. So you have the sense of the ancientness of the arcade contrast with the modernness of the locomotive, 
reflecting uh, Giorgio uh, de Chirico's father's role uh, as kind of a, a locomotive a railway engineer uh, in Greece. Um, and the contrast again between kind of uh, the modernness of the chimney, the ancientness of the statue. So we're getting, getting a collapsing of time. But in these depopulated spaces as well, there's kind of an eerie silence, an eerie quiet that kind of, on the one hand, makes them very you know, kind of, a, once you start looking, it makes them very difficult to stop looking at them. Uh, but on the other hand, it makes them, um, uh, there's a quietness to them, I think, uh, and that Smart is picking up on that. We know, for example, from 1948, his Piazza di Quirinale is almost a direct quotation of the Chirico, even in the name that he's choosing to use for it. Um, so, uh, yes, it's kind of rather than a Piazza d'Italia, this is the Piazza di Quirinale from 1948. We've got this, again, this kind of love of that receding curve, uh, showing kind of how that, uh, that building curves around the space. You've got kind of this, uh, these raking angles, that slight kind of looking up a rise into the piazza, the contrast of buildings of the sense of antiquity captured in the shadow, the antiquity of the, of the statue and the kind of the, the modernness of the ground in the piazza. So Smart is very aware of what the Kiriko is doing and is interested, he's experimenting uh, uh, with kind of these de Kirikesque ideas of landscape. We find that this influence of the Kiriko continues in some cases quite self-consciously in Smart's work uh, into the 1960s. Uh, so in the, well, in the middle of the 1950s here in Procida, it's very, very de Kirikesque, uh, kind of these contrast of objects uh, that's like, uh, I suppose, a de Kirikos surreal, or not quite surrealism in de Kirikos case, de Kiriko hated kind of the surrealists, even though he's often thought of as a founding influence on, on them. Uh, but we see that happening. Uh, we see Smart adopting this in the 1950s. And there's even a sense of that, this, this building in the background here with a solitary figure uh, from, the, uh, from the late 60s on the, in the road is also, I think, a de Kirikos reference, this very classicizing building looking out of place with its contrast with the, the modern road signs around it and this solitary figure walking, uh, walking up the road that is uh, unused by cars. Another key influence on Smart's work from this period uh, is Legere. Uh, and this is something that um, uh, Stephen Rogers uh, pointed me towards that he had been working on and thinking through. So there is an argument that the signage appears in Smart's work because Smart was in Europe when kind of this new um, uniform signage was created and it's a celebration of kind of this coming together of Europe after World War II. That argument, I think, is not very, it's very difficult to sustain and there's a much more obvious uh, influence of the use of signage in Smart's work. So in 1949, Smart studied with uh, Leger in Paris, although he said Leger was only ever kind of really in the studio for like half an hour on a Friday afternoon where he'd offer his advice. Uh, most of the work in Leger's uh, teaching studio was done by, uh, was done by his wife. Um, but while we kind of find one of the file signage uh, as a core element of an urban landscape is something that runs right throughout Leger's work from the 1920s on, Smart, I think, is doing something very different with it, something very visually, even though he's adopting the, this idea of kind of that uh, the signage is part of, the, of the, the urban world. It's an essential part of it. And we find that Smart uses signage quite consistently. But in 1949, Leger was also formulating a new theory of modern art uh, in which he argues that we need, uh, while well, he's saying that kind of, yes, in the 19 teens and 1920s, we created an unsentimental vision of the urban landscape, but we haven't been able to apply that to, uh, to the human subject yet. And he's arguing that the human subject must be liberated from sentimentality, that the role of a human being inside a painting is not for a, an emotional reason, that they're there, we have to find a way of representing people paired back from emotion. It's not about celebrating the person. And I think this has a, a very subtle influence in Smart's work. Uh, his use of people who are often, as Smart said, uh, you need a person in a painting sometimes just for scale, uh, that therefore, therefore uh, they're performing a formal function within the composition uh, and they are themselves reasonably insignificant uh, in some cases. But while Smart is looking at what these contem then contemporary artists were doing, he's also spending a lot of time exploring Renaissance and modern masters. And among all of the kind of the, uh, the modern masters, the artist who attracts him the most is Cezanne. And he keeps returning to Cezanne's work uh, uh, throughout his life, sometimes very, very directly quoting Cezanne uh, and Cezanne's understanding of geometry and, our, and compositional principles. Um, 
So Smart We Know is going out of his way to look at the art of Cezanne, as well as spending time looking at Piero della Francesca and Raphael and other kind of Renaissance masters. Um, and I was going to bring up uh, the bathers which he had seen in the National Gallery in London, uh, because there are, I think, very subtle uses of Cezanne's compositional methods that come through in some of Smart's work from this period. Uh, so uh, first of all, I just want to look, uh, get you to look at kind of the way that the Cezanne is using the bodies here as compositional devices, that the angles of those bodies on the left and the right create a kind of uh, a triangular shape. And that triangular shape is then echoed in the ground. Look at the way that kind of the ground on the right or merges in that use of the color up through the body. It helps actually ground these figures using a, a triangle in the middle of the composition like this helps give a sense of weight and gravitas to the painting. If we just move forward to then Smart's work in uh, Wallaroo from 1951, I think it's kind of we're getting at this use of the body as a compositional device, this angled body to help create that sense of balance and to give the ability, uh, give the composition a sense of gravitas. Um, but there are also a number of elements in this work in 1951 that become very familiar throughout uh, Smart's later later work. Uh, so, for example, the curved pipe and the use of posts. Uh, so while these posts here, they are, you notice the way that the post echoes the angle of the body on the left, the two bodies on the left, this slightly more vertical post then helps add a bit of balance and it helps kind of guide us around to look up through the pipe where we then have the angle of this almost ziggurat uh, in the background as kind of, a, kind of almost a reflection of that. So he's using uh, the angles of bodies, pipes, uh, beams and posts to help guide us through uh, from the foreground through the midground and into that background. We know that Smart had spent a lot of time sketching for this, and this is something that remains a fairly constant aspect of Smart's work. There is an awful lot of preparation, experimenting, playing around with different ideas uh, to try and get the composition right before he then starts working on a final painting. There's not much, um, um, you know, some artists just kind of attack the canvas and suddenly a painting appears. Smart's work has a lot of very, very carefully thought through geometry that underpins it. A lot of sketching, a lot of practice, trying to figure out how to make the composition work. And under some of the other sketches for Wallaroo, um, including kind of, you can see him kind of experimenting with the angle of the body, uh, the shape of the boat, the positioning of these posts, this pipe again, kind of uh, sketching and drawing to be able to make it, uh, doing a lot of preparatory work to be able to figure out the elements of the composition and how to make them work together in the most cohesive, coherent way. Smart's style, however, starts to change in the late 50s. And I think we start seeing a lot of his ideas and influences coming together. Uh, he's also beginning to have some success selling in Sydney and London in this period, uh, but still not the sort of success he would have later. Uh, throughout the 50s, he, in his time in Australia, he's unable to live off uh, selling his art alone. And he's doing a whole range of other jobs, working as a, an art critic, um, some of you may also remember him from being uh, one of the Argonauts um, on the ABC. Uh, and he's also for a time working as, uh, as an art teacher uh, for East Sydney Tech, which is now the National Art School. So he's doing a whole range of other jobs uh, because he can't support himself uh, from his painting alone. And I think that's partly because his style of painting and where he's going with this kind of pictorial realism, these quotations of a Renaissance understanding of pictorial space are going deeply against the grain. They, this isn't the direction that Australian painting is mostly taking. In the 1950s, uh, what's becoming increasingly popular, what's becoming dominant uh, uh, is different forms of abstraction uh, and the influence of abstract expressionism on Australian painting. So Smart is kind of pushing against the flow, pushing against what's becoming more popular. Uh, and when you start looking at his paintings from this period, uh, I think sometimes there's this wonderful sense of humour. Uh, I think in some cases he's almost flicking the bird uh, at, the, at these abstract painters. So when you look at this one, say from Trump, uh, Trump Park from 1961, and you look at the background and that wall, if you just kind of took that wall and removed the figures, removed everything else around it, what you would have there is something that looks a lot like a type of abstract expressionism. And Smart, I think here is saying, that's just the background. Um, that's just the wall. That's not the actual painting itself. Uh, we also have this wonderful play here where we've got the use of this mirror. 
often say if you're looking at a renaissance or high renaissance tradition of painting when you've got a mirror there you would often expect to see the artist in the mirror kind of uh, coyly working in the background even somebody like um Jan van Eyck frequently kind of seems to include himself as someone who's working in the mirror Velasquez and others do it too uh here we have a mirror that should perform that role but we see we don't see the artist the artist isn't present so it's again it's this uh, uh, uh art historical play uh playing with traditions while also saying that well this modern thing here this modern style is just the backdrop it's not kind of a painting in in itself um smart had very strong views on abstract art i won't go too much into those um uh doesn't mean he's right he just had those views um we also see, I think, in these works, and incidentally, there are a lot of places that Smart is painting in the 1960s that are uh, places you would go to uh, enjoy yourself without the public eye on you. Um, so that's kind of a, a whole extra part of the social history, I think, that Smart uh, is capturing in Australian cities like Sydney uh, in his work that isn't uh, fully, fully analyzed, hasn't fully been discussed. But anyway, uh, in this one, uh, Smart's uh, Kuji Bar's Winter One, uh, we have this wonderful, I think, sense of voyeurism and exhibitionism, uh, as well as the use of, I think, uh, an implied narrative that starts to come through in his work. Uh, this implied narrative is a sense that you don't, you that there is a story, there is something going on, but you only get a fragment of it, uh, and so you don't really know what it is. And I think that encourages a viewer to start speculating. In this case here, the way we're positioned, the way that these lines run across, the way the shadows here. They're guiding us up to look at the guy wearing his very, very short shorts. Uh, and from, as we look at him, it's almost natural to, to then see which way he's looking, which way he's gazing as he's gazing out. Uh, and his gaze follows. We use these lines here, these receding orthogonal lines to create the perspective. Uh, his gaze meets that perspective. So the perspective here is helping shape what he's looking at. But we can't see what he's looking at because our gaze is directed by these lines that are in the in the composition that guide us to look at him, uh, so it's this play between uh, to uh, between uh, I suppose uh, it's a type of voyeurism uh, in his work, um, as there is with in Trumper Park, where kind of you're looking at a, a couple having a private moment against the, against a wall in a park. It's a, again, it's not a traditional uh, topic uh, subject for all, uh, for painting. We see it too, uh, these, this use of implied narrative in Smart's Carl Expressway, uh, where kind of when you look at it, kind of the composition of it is spectacular. We've got these receding curves, a, re a curve receding upwards and around, another curve receding downwards and around, this kind of very place almost showing off, look what I can do. Um, and you have the solitary figure here um, who can't cross the road to go anywhere. There's nowhere to cross. So it's kind of why is this figure standing there on that, on that road? Uh, staring out at us. It's almost inviting us to try and interpret something that's going on in this work that we can't see. The part of this work, though, that's uh, smart from the surviving sketches seems to have been most focused on while, uh, while working, doing the preparatory work, though, isn't any of the stuff going on over here. Uh, the single most sketched uh, part of this work in the preparation is the roadworks going on in the back left hand corner. So you know, sketch after sketch, different angles, exploring how to use it compositionally, and then decides that all of that work just goes into creating this little, this little bit of action going on in the back corner. So while Smart's work is definitely coming together and his work is becoming identifiably, iconically smart, uh, we though see that in 1963, Smart returns to Europe. Uh, and while he's in Europe, his interest in cityscape starts to take a different direction. Uh, it starts to become more playful. We start to see his palette lightening and move away from kind of these heavier, darker, earthier tones to his increasing use of uh, brighter, more synthetic colors in his work. Um, we also, I think, start seeing that his, uh, the role of people in his work gets shrunk down smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, so that the people there uh, really are kind of there as a way of uh, performing a compositional function. They help give us, as the viewer, a sense of scale. Uh, there's also, I think, a lingering sense in this that uh, people are secondary to those things that give structure and direction to modern life. In this case here, uh, the communications tower, the radio tower, the lighthouse, these are all things that are about signaling, providing direction, structure, communication, and people are secondary to those. 
but there's a part of the playfulness I think of a work like this is you've got all these wonderfully modern stuff, uh, modern people, modern life uh, going on uh, in the midground. When you actually look at the foreground on this brick wall, you notice this wonderfully clever quotation of what looks like a, what looks like a Claude. So you've got this uh, very traditional classicizing reference in the foreground and almost this sense of you're moving from this to this that something in the composition of this helps uh, Smart inform Smart's understanding of his composition of these modern structures. In that sense, I think he's, he's positioning himself as somebody who's working, playing with, experimenting, having fun with these grand traditions of European art. Um, in something like the Control Tower from 1969 as well, uh, got the kind of the, the stronger, brighter colors, the focus on uh, objects of communication, but that communication uh, like with the radio tower, the control tower too, its communication is invisible, but yet gives structure and direction to modern life. You've got the people inserted through here, almost giving just there as kind of a way of creating scale. Uh, and this play with this kind of very, very complicated receding line, uh, this receding curve. In this case, looking up as a curve recedes around, but as you follow the bricks down, it's this very, very carefully controlled uh, curvature, which ultimately shows that our perspective is down here somewhere, that our eye level is more or less along uh, along this uh, row of bricks through here. So it's helping us situate ourselves within the painting as well as, uh, I think, in part showing off his control of perspective over very complicated shapes and structures. We also find that in, uh, in Smart's work, especially from the later 60s, our road signage starts becoming more and more important. Um, Smart tells a wonderful story where he suggests that he was one of the first people to ever to go down uh, Italy's first autostrada, the A1. Uh, he knew someone who knew someone who uh, took them on a drive along the autostrada the night before it officially opened. Um, so we're starting to kind of, there does seem to be a genuine love of this and it's a recurring kind of uh, thing you hear in Smart, often apocryphal stories about Smart from people who knew him. Uh, that kind of he would be driving down or be being driven down the road somewhere and would kind of get a vision of something of kind of hang on there's a painting back there we've driven past it uh, this sense that he would a uh, fleeting glimpse of what would become a great uh, a great painting um but we even though he uh he's uh, seems to be quite playful there's often a sense that some people get from his work of a loneliness in the cityscapes other people look at this work and they get a sense of quietness, everything in its place. Uh, other people feel that this is something that's almost uh, oppressive in the, la in the landscapes, that everything is too controlled, perhaps. Um, I think, though, what he says, sometimes people are just for scale. I think maybe yes, but I think in other cases, they seem to quite clearly be performing a different function. So, for example, on the approach to the City 3 here on the left, um, what are this couple doing? Kind of the road is an overpass. Are they, is it this uh, a son and his mother? Is he walking her home? Has he picked her up at the bus stop? Has she come to meet him in the bus stop and he's walking back home with her with his suitcase? Are they going to these apartments? But this road that they're walking up, this empty road, this empty overpass doesn't seem to go somewhere. So while they do help give us a sense of scale and they are very, very well placed to, for our gaze to follow them to walk, uh, to, to look directly into them. They don't look out to us. We're observing them. They're unaware that they're being observed. And they're kind of, they're hinting at a story that we can't quite grasp, something going on in his work that we don't quite fully see. Whereas on the right, at the end of the outer strata, you do kind of, you look at kind of, you get this wonderful contrast between his use of being able to paint uh, the textures and the different tones of the grass and the weeds on the side of the road. And the contrast that that makes with the modernity of the road, this kind of a man-made nature in contrast with one another. You have the red line of the, the outer strata ending in 7.500 meters is kind of uh, also directs us to look at this woman standing by herself on the side of a road. And again, I think this invites speculation. It makes us kind of wonder a little bit of what's going on, but where there's nothing in the painting that actually tells us what's going on. So again, it's this a use of an implied narrative. Um, the kind of uh, next kind of, I think, main change we start seeing in Smart's work happens in the early 1970s, uh, when Smart buys Posticcia Nuova in Tuscany, uh, and when he uh, settles down with uh, Emes de Zahn, uh, in uh, in Tuscany, uh, Smart writes very, very beautiful, beautifully about just how important uh, Amez was to him. Uh, but we, I think in this period from the early 70s onwards, we start seeing a new playfulness 
uh, in his work. His work uh, suddenly gains an, an even lighter touch to it, uh, even though the rigor behind that work is still very, very much there. In this case here in The Traveller, uh, I think we can look at it in terms of its composition, his use of these different lines that help guide us from this foreground, this foreground that really pushes out towards us. We're looking right up close against the bus. But while you have these rigid straight lines that are creating the orthogonals to give us that sense of space, you're looking at the way that Smart subverts that with the rippling of, uh, of, the, of the reflection across the panel. So it's this kind of a structure of, of something solid versus something that's slightly uh, rippled, something that's slightly flexible. Uh, the use of color, we're starting to see Smart use uh, stronger, more synthetic colors, stronger, richer colors, which again, I think these reflect the modern urban environment. Uh, and the use of implied narrative. Is this man at the bus station because he's arrived somewhere? Is he going somewhere? Uh, is he changing buses the way you have to in Italy? You kind of bus pulls up outside in a bus station outside of a city, you change from one bus to the next. We don't really know what's going on with this figure, the traveller. Uh, is he going? Is he coming? Is he changing? We don't know what part of the story he's in. And this is the way that I think, again, it's a, it encourages the viewer to look into the work and to speculate, to try and figure out what's going on. Uh, but this new playfulness in Smart's work is sometimes uh, purely a compositional game or a compositional challenge that he sets himself. In the case of truck and trailer approaching a city, uh, one of the things he's doing here is kind of this personal subversion of the rules of composition. So one of the rules of composition is that you should never use a canvas that is made of two squares because that shape of just two squares on a canvas is an ugly shape. It won't work. It won't allow for a balanced, harmonious composition. If you take this line that runs down the middle, the line between the light red and the red that's in the shadow, uh, it runs exactly down the middle of the canvas showing that this, is, this canvas is made of two squares joined together. Uh, so he's kind of almost like tug in cheek kind of, yeah, you say that's a rule, but watch me turn that rule upside down. How he creates balance in this one is pretty fantastic though. So if you take this side and superimpose it on that side and then take that side and superimpose it on the right side, um, you start seeing that these lines match up perfectly, that the balance here is created because the line of the red, uh, sorry, the line of the yellow trailer is almost exactly placed so that kind of if that you, when you superimpose it, the yellow then is repeated. Um, so it's kind of a, a very careful, uh, a very carefully created composition where he's subverting multiple sets of rules and conventions, almost simply showing, look, I can make this work. There's nothing really wrong with this shape. Um, you just need to have the right composition to fit the shape. Um, in some of his work too, uh, so we, in this case here with the red arrow, uh, he's, we're often seeing in his work from the 70s onwards, objects being placed in the work simply because something needs to be there to provide balance. So in this case here, we've got kind of these strong kind of red lines zigzagging, uh, the way that these zigzag red lines are all pushing us off to the right hand side, whereas that left arrow is going pushing against the stream, it's swimming upstream against the current. Uh, you've got a sense here that there are uh, of where there should be a perspective that what creates a uh, pictorial depth in this work is just the, the yellow motta sign up here, the billboard, and the lines of that help give us a single orthogonal that give us a, a sense of that uh, space receding behind that fence. Uh, but if you imagine you took this palm tree out, you would suddenly have this void. The palm tree here is essential. Something needed to be placed here. I know it's a, sometimes it looks like a pot plant um, is being placed here. And that helps complete, it helps us see this line up here, that this line by pointing in the direction of this means that we can see this and it helps us create, uh, realize that there is a structure. Whereas if that's not there, we have a void and the, the composition would fall apart. Uh, so an object is being placed simply for the, the in, in the interest of making the composition work. It's putting the right object in the right place with the right color. Part of Smart's playfulness that we see right through the 70s and into the 80s too, is a playfulness with perspective, playing games with perspectives. Again, this love of this receding line, but you try and figure out uh, in this work here, are you looking slightly down? Is he's, uh, it's a technique that he gets from Suzanne and Suzanne himself had used this technique, uh, uh, which had been used in still life tech, uh, painting for a couple of hundred years before Suzanne, where you need to extend that foreground. Uh, you kind of, and to create more foreground space at the expense of the mid and the background, you often have to slant the table slightly. 
Uh, so when you look at still lives, sometimes it looks like if, if you were to stand in front of that actual table, everything would fall off, gravity would pull it down. But it's, that's a technique to create more foreground space to arrange your objects. In this case here, Smart is creating all of this space in the foreground and he's leaving that uh, mostly empty. Just a few basic forms, uh, the pyramid, the cone, the circle, uh, which are also quotations of Cezanne's understanding of, of composition, that everything is based on a sphere, a pyramid or, or a cone uh, and, uh, and a cube or a angular prism and Smart's playing with those ideas. But we also see Smart picking up again on this wonderful interest in this interplay between the old and the new. Uh, so in the case of the corrugated Jaconda, uh, we, again, we have an object placed up here, the palm trees placed up here just to kind of uh, to help guide our eye to give us a sense of receding space behind this fence that we can't see through. So he's creating a sense of invisible depth, perhaps. Uh, but also I think what he's doing here is he's bringing the high, he's bringing high culture down into a common field of vision that a poster of, or kind of a, that visually, what we're getting here is signage. We're getting an advert for co-op, uh, kind of a, a major Italian supermarket chain, um, uh, side by side with, um, with Leonardo da Vinci, uh, that these are common parts of an, an, a very ordinary urban experience. What he's trying to do, I think, is create a realistic field of vision. This is the way our cities actually look. This is what we actually see. I think that's part of one of the great strengths of Smart's work is that not only is his work instantly identifiable when you walk into an art gallery, it's a very distinctive style of his own, uh, but it's very, very common that you walk around a city or you walk around part of Italy and you see, oh, wow, that looks exactly like a Jeffrey Smart. And I think that's truly amazing. It's very, very rare, for example, that kind of you walk down the road and you're thinking of, oh, that person looks like a Picasso. Um, if somebody looked like a Picasso, that would be very unfortunate, I think. Whereas with Smart, he's able to, by bringing these things together, he's able, I think, is able to show us a, a beauty in the, the absolutely ordinary visions we get of cities, of things in fields, of, um, and he's able to show us that these things are actually beautiful in their own right. Uh, and as a kind of a, a legacy for an artist, I think that's a truly extraordinary legacy to be able to create. Nonetheless, he is still deeply influenced in the tradition. So in this homage to Cezanne, uh, guiding spheres, it, it's a direct play. Again, he's quoting the, the basic forms of Cezanne, the sphere, the cone and the rectangular prism. Uh, it's a work that is very definitely smart. So if you see this in a gallery or see this hanging in a collection, you know it's his, but we also have this wonderful quotation of Cezanne and this way that these spheres, uh, when you're looking at what's actually holding them up, we see neither post anywhere, uh, but to be, it's an almost impossible vision. How would you get these spheres to go up and over a hill without something tie, to tie them uh, up and off the ground? So they, they give us a sense of them hovering in midair. But this, and I think with this, uh, is this playfulness in Smart's work, despite having said that sometimes people are there just for scale, that kind of there's a lack of sentimentality in his uh, capturing of, of people. When we look at his playfulness, uh, we look at his uh, work as a portraitist, we see a similar playfulness in his work, this rich uh, set of illusions. Uh, so this is just one of the portraits he created of David Malouf. Uh, the sketched portrait here, the drawn portrait on the right hand side is used in another port, ends up here appearing in another portrait he uh, created of David Malouf. Uh, but with Malouf here seen in profile, um, we get this wonderful play uh, with a sense here of the kind of Malouf may be holding this or is that kind of that structure, this extremely difficult, complicated, curved structure receding bending, curling through space and down into the ground. It's almost kind of about smart showing off. Um, uh, and it was something he would keep playing with. It's, it's an extremely difficult shape. So if you say you look at a Dutch still life and you see that there's a, a lemon that's been peeled and that lemon peel curls down, uh, that's another way of an artist showing off. This is an extremely complicated shape to show in space. But part of the playfulness here is with kind of the reference up above that the apartment block under which uh, Malouf stands is Ovidio, uh, Ovid. Uh, um, and again, it's a, I think that's a play on Malouf's use of Ovid, um, um, engagement with Ovid, and it's something that's just as smart engages with the great traditions of European painting. Malouf very self-consciously engaged with the great traditions of European literature as well. 
Uh, so there's a commonality in there, but it's shown so playfully and just kind of, this is just the name of an apartment building. Um, it just happens to be Ovid in the background. And another kind of sense of playfulness too, when it comes to the much loved portrait of Clive James, um, where Smart had been looking at, um, had been trying to draw Clive James's face for quite some time. And he wrote that kind of, he has a very strange face that his ears are too big and they're off center. They're not at the same height. His eyes don't quite work. His nose is off one way. His cheekbones are at different heights. It's actually a really awkward face to paint. Uh, and he did actually do some great um, portraits of him uh, that, are, that you can actually see this going on. Uh, and he said, he said he kept working on his, working on capturing his portrait until he got it down to the size of a postage stamp. And that postage stamp size portrait seems to be the right thing for Clive James. And again, it's that kind of a, that sense of humour. Clive James is a man who's larger than life and he's going to have his portrait created by Jeffrey Smart, in which case the portrait is about the size of a postage stamp. And all you see instead is this brilliant yellow kind of a corrugated fence in the foreground. Uh, so it's subverting the idea of portraiture, uh, but it's also kind of a teasing Clive James at the same time. Uh, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful portrait. But I suppose kind of ultimately kind of what Smart is able to do is that he's able to use this, these traditions, his understanding of, of the techniques, the compositional practices, his understanding of, the, of European art history was exceptional. But he quotes that just as easily as an element of the urban environment, as easily as he quotes graffiti, advertising, street signs, cars, that all of these things are part of our modern visual world. In this case here with the large, large placard, it's a whopping great big billboard for tobacco. Um, and he uses that as an equal part of our visual world as say kind of uh, Cezanne, or in the case of an art gallery in a shopping arcade. This is a shopping arcade where we have a very kind of a traditional landscape painting in the window, but the structure of the arcade, his use of color, his use of shape looks a lot like the style. Um, so he's quoting kind of both modern and the other. These are all common parts of our visual world. And I think that comes together beautifully in something like Matisse in Ashford, where art and life are equal, equal members, that what you see at a train station, what you see on a sign uh, can be as beautiful as Matisse. Uh, it can be as simple as an, as an advert, uh, and it can be these play of lines or this play of light and shade, these plays of colours, these things that make up a modern visual world. And it's Smart's capacity, I think, to show us the, our modern visual world where in a way that art and life become equal partners that makes him such a, a loved artist. Uh, you know, I shall end here for today, but I've got plenty of time for questions if you have some. I'll just open up the, the Q&A so and the chat so I can see. I guess we have a question from Jack about Smart's work being so readily recognisable. Uh, what has his influence been on other artists? Um, uh, on people like Rick Moore, for example. One of the things I think to, the first thing I'd like to say to answer that, Jack, is that Smart's, well, Smart was not, while he had very, very strong opinions about what good art was, what art should be, what he wanted to do with his own art, he wasn't very interested in being able to found a school of art. Um, I think he, see, he saw his own work as something, this is the art that he makes, this is unique to him. Um, uh, and because uh, once he was supporting himself off his art in Italy, he's not really kind of founding a school indirectly by becoming a great teacher of many, many people. Nonetheless, he is deeply engaged with other artists and uh, deeply engaged in the art world. Um, and I think he, the influence that he, have, he has is uh, people's love of his work. Um, so it's not, uh, they're influenced by his work because they enjoy it. Uh, they appreciate, they find it fascinating um, rather than smart trying to create a, a school of, of art of people who would paint or would, or would see the world in the same way that he did. Um, we have a question from Leon about uh, who is the portly gentleman in many of the expressway and bus paintings? That's a fantastic question. Um, there are a few different theories um, that often the portly gentleman seems to be a figure who's uh, sometimes called the controller, um, that he's this 
uh, the figure in charge. So in the case of the Autostrada paintings, uh, bus stop paintings, paintings, all of this signage, um, he's often the only man in a suit. He seems quite out of place. Um, he's obviously quite wealthy. Who he is exactly, I think, is um, less important as a specific character and more the idea of a as a kind of a um, one of the one of those figures who are in control of that signage. So he might say in the expressway uh, one that I showed, you have him standing there almost like he's the one who is opening the gate. Um, but in the background, you'll notice that there are other people, other men who are busy cleaning the signs. So all of this world of signage, uh, we have people there who are leading, guiding the signage, and you have people the, whose role, the maintenance workers, uh, who are in smarts work often seem to be there uh, to exist simply to look after the signage. Uh, so I think in that sense here, we sometimes think of that uh, the portly gent as being uh, uh, as the controller. Um, yes. Um, just uh, check to see if there are, if you have other questions uh, that you would like to, to bring up. Let's check the chat to see if there are. Thank you. I can see you coming through in the chat. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm glad that you've enjoyed it and you've, um, uh, yeah, I hope you've kind of got something extra, something new you can take away uh, for the next time you're either walking around the city and see something that kind of reminds you of a smart or the next time you're looking at smarts work. Um, always very, very happy to come in and talk. So thank you very much. Uh, for our very, um, very kind and very generous uh, comments coming through in the chat.